what I thought I'd do is just make some opening statements that set the historical uh, basis for why we're here today and how it developed, uh, setting the stage for the hearing this afternoon. The, the matter before the court today is based on a two-phase proceeding. At initial, at the time the case was commenced, there was an initial plea of uh, not guilty to the charge in the original information. <clears throat> then there was a second plea of <clears throat> not guilty by a reason of mental disease or defect. The matter was set for a jury trial on both of those on both of those pleas. On August 21, 2017, Ms. Wire entered a plea of guilty to the charge in the amended information, which was attempted second degree intentional homicide, party to the crime with a dangerous weapon. <clears throat> the phase on the not guilty plea by reason of mental disease or defect would continue on to a jury trial. The maximum sentence on the amended charge of the second degree attempted homicide is uh, 30 years imprisonment, which breaks down to 20 years of initial confinement, 10 years of extended supervision. The dangerous weapon enhancer constitutes an additional five years of confinement. Thus, the maximum sentence on the criminal charge is 35 years of imprisonment, meaning uh, 25 years of initial confinement and 10 years of extended supervision. <clears throat> Based upon the plea that was entered to the uh, attempted second degree homicide charge. The uh, circumstances after the plea, at the time of the plea, were, were as follows, and both the state and the uh, defense, Ms. Wire, agreed to these circumstances. If the <clears throat> not guilty by reason of mental disease trial what resulted in a verdict not in Ms. Wire's favor, she would be sentenced on the state's recommendation on the criminal charge of 20 years imprisonment. Uh, meaning 10 years initial confinement, 10 years extended supervision. If on the jury trial for the NGI plea, the jury found Ms. Wire was not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, then the case proceeds on that verdict. The state would at the sentencing hearing on that portion of the case agreed to that the commit that, and Ms. Wire agreed to this as well, that the commitment would be to institutional care and that she would not seek a conditional release until July 1, 2020. <clears throat> that was the basis of going through to the trial, and ultimately <clears throat> the jury trial came back in the uh, not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect phase and found that she was not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. In doing, <clears throat> in doing that, the jury answered two questions in the affirmative. First question was, at the time the crime was committed, did the defendant have a mental disease or defect? The jury said yes. The jury also found affirmatively that as a result of the mental disease or defect, that Ms. Wire lacked substantial capacity either to appreciate the wrongfulness of the conduct or to conform her conduct to the requirements of law. <clears throat> so that's the basis that brings us here today for a uh, sentencing on the commitment portion of the case. From that standpoint, does the uh, state have anything to comment upon or state with regard to the sentence? I think what you stated was correct and accurate, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Does the defense agree with my comments? Yes, sir. All right. Then does the state wish to make any statements as to the sentence? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. As you just pointed out, the in return for the amendment, the agreement is that the defendant will agree to institutional care not to seek conditional release until July 1st of 2020, which really, and, and in terms of the institutional care, as you know, because you have in front of you, the predispositional investigation also agrees that institutional care is appropriate. So I don't think there's much of an issue there. The only <clears throat> real issue that's left remaining is how long should the commitment be? As you know, the maximum commitment is the maximum period for which she could be confined since 25 years. And that would date back to the date on which she was taken into custody, which is the date of violation in this matter, so back to May of 2014. So then we'd be looking forward to 25 years, or looking forward, 25 years from that date would be the maximum term of commitment. You have received a victim impact statement from the victim's mother, Stacy. I can tell you that 
no one from the victim's family wishes to orally address the court at this time. They're all relying. They believe that Stacy's statement is accurate and accurately reflects their feelings also. So it's even though it's signed by Stacy, it's more of a, a family-wide victim impact statement, I guess is the best way to put it. So then, as I said, we're left with the question of how long should the commitment be? The state believes that the maximum commitment of 25 years is appropriate. That would take us to 2039 at a point in time when the defendant would be 37 years of age. I guess my first thought is that considering the nature and gravity of this offense, being supervised until the age 37 is not all that long, given all the facts and circumstances here. It may be a long time in some respects, but it's not a long time in terms of the fact that Peyton is looking at a lifetime of scars and psychological scarring, physical scarring that she's going to have to deal with. So saying that 25 years is a long time pales in comparison to that. As, as you know from Stacy's letter to the court, Peyton still suffers. She can't leave her drapes open. She can't leave her windows unlocked. This still affects her. But yet in spite of that, and in spite of her young age, she believes, which is as was noted in that statement and why the reason we agreed to this plea agreement, she believes that Anissa needs institutional care. Well, I don't know, frankly, how much time Ms. McMahon is going to argue for. State's thoughts on this is real simple. The maximum commitment, considering the lifetime of suffering that Peyton looks forward to, will help her to derive a modicum of solace, knowing that at least for those 25 years, or what's left of those 25 years, that someone will be looking over Anissa's shoulder so that she doesn't have to worry that Anissa is looking over her shoulder. I, frankly, I think it makes sense. It, and I understand, because it's come up over and over, this argument about the juvenile brain and how it's not formed, and et cetera. But the fact of the matter is, we don't know that, in effect, Anissa is going to age out of this type of behavior, which I assume is part and parcel of an argument for less than the maximum commitment, is that well, you know, once she gets that mature adult brain, this won't be an issue. We don't know that. What we do know is what she did now. We do know that she was susceptible to a shared delusion. We have no way of saying whether she's not susceptible to a shared delusion in the future, whether that be three years from now, <clears throat> 22 years from now. The fact of the matter is, Judge, we believe that the only real that I can think of, once at a certain point, assuming for the sake of argument that Anissa is doing better, she's going to be released from conditional, unconditional release at some point. If she's doing better, her supervision will do nothing more than making sure that she continues to comply with her treatment recommendations and making sure that she's not backsliding. The state doesn't see how that could be a bad thing, Your Honor. And in fact, if she's not doing well, which would be an argument, I guess, we don't want her locked up for 25 years, but if she's not doing well, that's exactly why she should be locked up for 25 years. So really, if she's doing well, this shouldn't be a big problem. And if she's not doing well, then she absolutely should be. She would be a danger then to herself or others, which is exactly why she should be locked up for 25 years in an institution. And I probably shouldn't use the word locked up, but I, I think we all know what I'm talking about. But if she's having problems, she needs care. If she's not having problems, this commitment will be very easy for her. She'll just simply prove to her supervisor, supervising agent, that she's doing well, that she's doing the things that are required of her, and that she's not having any problems. If she's not doing well, as I said, that supervision will become important, both for the victim as well as for the community as well as the defendant because if she's not doing well she will that would mean she needs help and the only way we can ensure that she gets that help through this case is the maximum commitment so we're asking that you impose 25 years of commitment in this case and that's that's all i had there what position do you take on medication your honor the state's position at this moment is i don't know that well, strike. Let me. I believe that if she needs medication, if we're going to see her improve, if we're going to see her hopefully get released at some point down the road, that that she would have to take that medication. So the state believes the court should order that she be required to take all medications that are required of her. 
Thank you. Then, then Attorney McMahon, how do you wish to proceed? Your Honor, I have some statements from the family that we've recorded. I would like to play those first, if the court would allow me. All right. <clears throat> now, are the uh, when you when you play them, are the vi videos or are they? Uh... It's, a, it's a video, sir. All right. And I have, if the court wishes, a copy of it on um, <clears throat> on a flash drive. Well, before we start, then we should have the flash drive then uh, filed with the court, Certainly. and that'll become an exhibit. As an officer of the court, you're representing that the flash drive contains a true and accurate copy of what you're playing in court. Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> now, on that basis, when we do something like this, the uh, court reporter need not take the transcript down. We rely then upon the true record of wording what's said then on the video. Very good, you can proceed. When we first started going there, she was a little girl, she was 12. Now, excuse me. She had we no concept to, we have to identify of how serious who this, this matter was. She would talk about well, what she was going it. to dress up for as Halloween costumes. Now we have to identify who is the speaker, and perhaps you should start from the beginning then. And this will, of course, be on the record. The first speaker will be John Wire, same spelling as Ms. Wire, her grandfather. Also present in most of the scenes with him will be his wife, Melanie. Melody. Melody, I'm sorry. A little nervous. Also speaking will be William Wire, father of Anissa, and Sarah Wire, um, sister of Anissa. So what we should do then, just to be sure that the, our record's clear, that when the, when the senior Mr. Wire is complete, we, and, the, and then the, the younger Mr. Wire testifies, we should have it, uh, you should state that. The problem, Your Honor, is it does... It's it a is, continuum? It's a continuum. All right, so the three people speaking on a video, that's a continuum. And you've identified who Four they people. are. Sarah Wire. Four people. Well. All right. All right, very good. Proceed and what, where she was going to be trick-or-treating that year. It was very difficult to sit there knowing that she wasn't going anywhere. When she would first come in to the room, she would be happy to see us, but there were times during our conversations where she would look almost blank. I think that she probably was thinking, I wonder what my grandparents think of me now. There have been times when she said, I don't know why I would have done this. I can't figure it out. And that would bother her an awful lot. She says, I take this one day at a time. That's how I get through it. I keep myself busy with my schoolwork. I keep myself busy with helping with whatever I can do. She's almost taken on this role of, of pod mommy, as some people call her. You know, she knows how things function there. She has helped other kids learn the day-to-day -day routine. I'll use the term more like a, a teacher's aide now, where she's been through these courses, she knows, and she's very instrumental in helping other students with their schoolwork and, and their learning. She advises other kids or almost sometimes counsels other kids when they're having a bad day, trying to give them different perspective. She's very good at letting people know that, that you know, there's, there's light at the end of your tunnel, so don't get down, don't let juvenile detention define who you are. I think this experience with her will give her an inside path to others who will need this kind of guidance. Because of her experiences in West Bend, she's talked about going to school and becoming an advocate for children in her situation. She was taking online courses while in West Bend she read, she did the work, she learned, she got through it, 
she got a good grade and you know she wants to continue that she wants to get her high school diploma she wants to go on to college she goes someday i want to get married i want to i want to find a guy that loves me and i love him and i want to get married and have kids and she goes and then i think to myself do you think that's going to work will my kids disown me if they find out what i did Will my husband leave me? All the uh, psychiatrists and psychologists who testified had said that the uh, chance of recidivism is nil. Three of the doctors that testified all told the court that they feel, based on independent reports, that Anissa poses little to no threat to society and her treatment would be best served with probably two years of talk therapy. She's grown mentally and physically in the last almost four years. She knows what she did was wrong. I hope with the judge's sentencing of Anissa, he takes into consideration what he's learned for in the last three and a half years. She will have had time to talk through what's been going on in her head and try to get some sense of why she allowed herself to get involved in this situation. I know for a fact that she wants to come home and I know that she's tired of sitting, but I know that she knows that she needs the help and I know that she's okay getting the help. I miss having her around because it's just she's got a really good energy. She's a good person, like deep, deep down, honestly, she really is. Every time I talk to her, she's just always got this like light in her face. And she's just so happy. Now, now she's counting down the days until she can come home because that's like one of the main things that's keeping her afloat. Every day of our lives, we think about why did this happen? Is there anything we could have done? I think about them every day. I think about how they're doing. I think about their opinions of Christy and I as parents. I think about their opinions of Anissa. I hope that they can find it in themselves to see that Anissa is a good person and accept the apologies from the family for everything that all of the families involved in this, this tragedy have gone through over the last three and a half years. Memorial Day 2014 is a day not one of the families involved in this tragedy will ever forget. I cannot fathom the shock, fear, and anger that the Leitner family experienced that day. To send one's child off to a sleepover with friends only to have her attacked is something no parent should have to experience. I would like to offer my heartfelt apologies to the Leitner family for having this thrust upon them. Thankfully, Peyton survived. It's something we've got to live with the rest of our lives. It'll never go away. But seeing her with the attitude she has and how upbeat she is and making the best of this situation helps us to get through this ordeal also. When we first started going there, she was... Mrs. Weyer was unable to make the filming in. I don't know if she has anything she wishes to add. I didn't hear what she said. I agree with the family statements. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that you're here. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
as a party to a crime in this stabbing, I could understand that as the court sentence. But we're dealing with someone who was 12 at the time. What he's asking for, in essence, Your Honor, is for you to commit her for two times as long as she had been alive at the time this happened, plus a year. To me, that doesn't make sense. And perhaps it's because I also work, as Your Honor has at times, in the mental health portion of our court system. So I'm aware that if there is any evidence of future dangerousness when one nears the end of an NGI commitment, that there are options available to secure treatment, to require medication, to require hospitalization. So I, I don't share the fears Mr. Osborne has, and I think in our country we see any deprivation of liberty, whether it is for a meritorious purpose such as treatment or um, simply for punishment. We don't do that without reason and without measure. And one of the important reasons behind doing limiting the amount of time one controls a person is, frankly, the other persons to whom you expose them. The evidence-based practices that have become common in our criminal justice system have come over from the human sciences because of important information, like the more you expose someone to more seriously criminal individuals, the more likely you are to harm that person and harm their behavior, not help it. That's why in criminal cases, probation is the presumptive in the beginning. And that's why our probation departments have begun dividing up who comes on what day to their office to avoid exposing low-risk offenders to high-risk offenders. Because as our mothers told us, it's not you I don't trust, it's your friends sometimes, and the choices you make when you're around them. The reality is, Anissa is going to be in a hospital setting for quite some time. And when the state asks, does to stipulate to that when within the statutes there are provisions for people seeking release and is supposed to be based upon doctor recommendations. Our young client was the one who said, no, they're right. I need that. She talked about how she had been away from normal society for so long that when they were, when her parents were allowed to bring a treat in to a visit that required the use of a fork, they had to teach her how to use it again. Because in secure detention, that's not a utensil they have access to. When you look at that, this child sat there and explained to us that she needed help learning not only to deal with the nightmares that don't allow her to sleep, with the fears and the concerns she has about, could I ever do this again? What do I need to do to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again? She felt she needed that time in the hospital. Your Honor has perhaps more information about this young woman than most persons who will ever come in front of you or any other judge, given the reverse waiver hearing, the competency evaluations, the Miranda Goodchild hearings, looking at both her functional abilities, her intellectual abilities, her mental health issues, and her behavior while maintained in a secure detention facility without medication for 1,301 days now. Many children slack off. I, well, how many days did you say? 1,301 if you count today. All right, thank you. 
I noted that one of the media outlets reflected that my client had developed quite a sense of humor when you had asked her about school one time and she informed you quite proudly that she went to school every day. Um, the court is aware and, and those of us who work with children who are incarcerated know that sometimes, depending on where you are, if you're incarcerated and you refuse to go to school, it counts as a mark against you, but they don't force you to go. She chose to go because school is important to her, because learning is important to her, and she knows it's important to the court. She, when trying to figure out where her life will take her from now, she knew that there were two options. One would be a hospital, and she knew that Winnebago, because she discussed it with us, was where generally females are sent on NGI, or Copper Lake until the adult system. She researched and found that while she was being now doing online schooling at West Bend, and they put that program in place so that she could expand her abilities to learn, she also learned that neither place uses computer schooling. So she worked with her teachers to create a curriculum that would transfer no matter where she was going because she wants to be future focused and she wants to excel at whatever the court asks of her. The statements that her father made about the, the things Anissa wants to do now are things that Mr. Smith and I heard as time went on as Anissa was in secure detention and saw some things that troubled her. She was very thankful as were her family for the professionalism and really the kindness of the staff both at our secure detention facility and at the West Bend secure detention facility. She uh, jokingly refers to the staff there as her step parents because for three and a half years in, in essence they've been in local parentis. But she saw that many children come into secure detention who in her opinion didn't need to be there children who were placed there because there was no place else to put them. Because as children grow older in our juvenile system, it's hard to find a foster home that wants to take them. And until that is found, sometimes that was the only option. It bothered her a lot. She talked to Mr. Smith and me about how she wished that this wouldn't make it so that she couldn't someday be either a foster parent or, or run a group home for children who had a run history or had a delinquency that made it so that foster homes didn't want to take them because she had learned getting to know these children during the short stays they had that they were good children. They just needed someone to believe in them and someone to have their back. That troubled her a lot, it still does. I really think it troubles a lot of us who work in the juvenile court system. But to have this child who was facing so much on her own see how unfair that was to other people. That was impressive to me. And it also reflected a change in who she wanted to be and what she wanted to do when she was older. She did a pa little pamphlet when she was, I believe, in fourth grade. Um, she was 10 years old when she did this. It's called My Life. And I have a copy for the state and for the court, simply because it gives you a picture of Anissa Wire two years before this happened. She could have been anyone's job. In the end, she talked about her future, the last page of it. It was going to go like this. Ten years from now, I'll be 20 and training to be a zoologist. Parentheses. Person that works at a zoo. Close parentheses. In 20 years, I'll be 30 and have a husband and a big lazy dog. In 30 years, I'll be 40 and be a zoologist until I retire. That's my future. Well, many of us have changed what we wanted to be from the time we were 10. Some of what Annie wanted for herself is still the same. And some of it has changed. She wants to give back and help kids. 
Mr. Still, as the court knows from all of the reports you've received, is worried about endangered species, climate change, things that affect the planet. But she knows before she can do any of that, she needs to seek help and make herself the healthiest person she can be. Your Honor, I think if the court is looking at what makes sense, when Your Honor was making the order at the end of after the arguments at the reverse waiver hearing, you focused on what we knew about brain development and what we've learned over time, and that generally between 21 and 25, we have a very good picture of who this person is as an adult. 21 to 22, if you're a female who hasn't experienced significant trauma in mental health. Anissa's um, participation in the stabbing of Peyton, as well as the time that she has spent taken from her family and separated from them physically would qualify in psychiatric terms as trauma that can affect the maturation process. In some ways, it's made her much more mature than a lot of children, but in many ways, it's left her still 12 years old, not having had the formative experiences of high school um, that other children have. So it's sort of a mix there. I don't think, Your Honor, that we need to look at committing this child beyond her 25th birthday. I think that is what makes sense here. That would allow a period of time at the hospital and then time on extended release if it were appropriate, and that would be up to the doctors. I don't believe within the report that the doctors opined that Anissa was not competent to make her decisions regarding medication. I I think that's a decision we should leave in the hands of the hospital if they feel that she needs to take medicine and she's refusing it they will seek an order court knows that i know that we have a young girl who's been on this earth since november 10th of 2001. i'm not really good with numbers but i like when i can quantify something that's 500 5,885 days, 1,301 of which have been spent in West Bend Secure Detention. She spent almost a quarter of the life that she's lived in custody. So it's time to move her to the hospital. And it's time to let her move forward. But I do not think we need to hold her twice the length of the time that she had been on this earth before this terrible incident. I, I want to thank Mrs. Leitner for her, her letter. The terrible pain it expresses for their family. I know that my client is, is beyond sorry for. And she knows that she can never fix what happened. She can never change what happened, but she can work to make sure she's the best person that she can be to honor Peyton. I particularly made sure to share with Anissa the last paragraph the fact that Peyton wanted her to go to the hospital. But the reason the family was willing to accept what we had talked about as a, as a plea deal was because their daughter wanted these two girls, not just Anissa, but Morgan too, to go to the hospital and get help. It tells an awful lot about what a wonderful child Peyton is and is something that I think was probably one of the kindest things my client has heard in three and a half years. It made her cry, but it, I think, was healthy and healing for her to be able to hear that that was what Peyton wanted. And she knows that it is unlikely that Peyton would ever want to have contact with her again, and so she will stay away from her. 
she has in the past, after we had talked with her about some of the options the juvenile system or offers, one of which is oftentimes victim offender mediation that's been used also in adult systems um, at times if, if the Leitner family ever wanted that and felt it would be healthy for Peyton, she needs that or wants that. Anissa is more than willing to participate in that. She knows it's not likely, but if that was something that would help Peyton, she would do it. So, Your Honor, I am asking you to consider the amount of time already that she has had in custody. Mr. Osborne says, well, we don't know who she is, who she's gonna be. But we know for three and a half years in very difficult circumstances that she has managed to follow the rules and not allow herself to be influenced by some very, the other persons that she was placed with for a long period of time. She has worked hard and done what was expected of her in a situation that very few children have ever been in, being in custody that long. Now there are children who go to Lincoln Hills or Copper Lake and may be there for that length of time but they have access to the outdoors. It was only after about 260 days, maybe longer, when Your Honor authorized the visits here in Waukesha that Lisa had any access to natural light. As the court may recall from the testimony at the reverse waiver hearing from Nicole Sekak, who runs the West Bend Secure Detention Facility, their natural light requirement is met by a frosted skylight in the day room. The only glimpses of the outside and used to have were on trips to court until she was allowed to go shoot baskets in the courtyard of our secure detention facility. But that same amount of time from the date of May 31st, 2014, until our first visit at the juvenile detention center, were also time spent without physical contact with her parents. And without any contact with her older sister, her older brother, or her younger brother because they were not allowed on the visitor's list because they limited to parents and grandparents. When we look at things that in the criminal system would be seen as um, indicators that the person is likely to respond well to, to supervision and to respond well to societal um, expectations, one of the primary things we look at is is support. Is there a pro-social family behind this child? And the answer is yes. Not only are they hardworking people, they have spent, I believe, every day, there may have been one or two days that were missed, but every day since May 31st of 2014, they set up a visitation schedule and between her mother, her father, her, and her grandparents who spoke, they visited her. They were careful to avoid school hours because Anissa didn't want to be taken out of her classes. But that sort of devotion and that sort of willingness to stand with the child no matter what, I think is another thing the court should take into consideration when determining the length of time needed on a commitment. Her family, knowing now what they know, knowing that she has a disorder, and knowing that particularly with a delusional disorder, it was Dr. Kavanaugh at the reverse waiver hearings testified that given the lengths a person will go to to protect the delusional structure, that they would not have notified parents. They wouldn't have done things to show them what was happening. They know this now, and they can watch, and they will. And I think they will probably be far more um, far more and long-standing support for Anissa to keep her on the right path. So, Your Honor, given how long she was spent in custody, how young she was at the time, the remorse that she has shown throughout this, I would ask you to consider allowing the commitment to end on the 25th birthday. I think that makes sense. 
and I'm hoping that you will do that. All right. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Then, Ms. Weyer, do you want to say anything? I just want everyone involved in this to know that I do hold myself accountable for this and that I will do whatever mm -hmm. I have to do to make sure that I don't get any sort of delusion or whatever again. And I want everybody involved to know that I deeply regret everything that happened that day and that nothing, I know that nothing I say is going to make this right, Your Honor, and nothing I say is going to fix what I broke. I'm just hoping that by holding myself somewhat accountable and making myself responsible for what I took part in that day, that I can be responsible and make sure this doesn't happen again. I'm never going to let this happen again. I'll do whatever I have to do to I'll do whatever I have to do to make sure that this doesn't happen. And I know you've heard that before and you're probably going to hear it again. But it's the truth. And I'm sorry. And well, thank you for your comments. I appreciate them. Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. My comments stand. I don't think that, obviously, they're not the same as Ms. Camp, but I don't think she said anything that I didn't really need to comment on. Other than the one thought I did have is that 25 is not a magic number in this whole case. I say we should go until 25. That may be an average day when the juvenile brain is fully developed, but it's just a day. So I think, though, that supervision that would go to H37 is much more appropriate for all the reasons that I mentioned. All right, thank you. Then Ms. Then Ms. McMahon, anything further? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. As was uh, noted, the court did receive the letter from, from Pate and some others, Stacey Lautner, and I've read that and have been distributed to the parties, so I'm aware of its contact content. The court also, at the time of the, uh, of the, uh, jury verdict on September 15th, I did order a predispositional report from the, uh, th through the statutory process, and Wisconsin Correctional Service is the one that prepares that report, and they did submit the report on November 3rd. It's a, it's a rather detailed report, a, a very thorough, at least appears thorough. It's uh, seven pages in length, and it discusses the, uh, Ms. Ms. Wire's current status or current situation things that had happened at the West Bend Detention Center and what their recommendation is and how the case should proceed from their standpoint. So I read that and I, the parties have each had that as well. The court follows a uh, statute, this type of case is in court under section 971.17 and in uh, the Wisconsin statutes and specifically when the uh, the court arrives at doing the determining the commitment, the court looks at 971.17 sub 3 sub A, which gives the court the authority to issue the commitment and gives the court the authority to uh, and criteria that the court looks at and thinks through in deciding what the commitment should be. So I reviewed that statute and I have have that in mind as I review the case today. As has been uh, discussed earlier, the, the, the nature of this case is that the maximum period of the commitment is the maximum conf period of confinement that's available with, under the criminal charge. And as I indicated earlier, that's 25 years. And that's why that number has been, has been discussed by the state and presented by the court in my initial comments. There was, as I indicated initially, as part of the, the plea, and when there's a, a plea is entered, a plea negotiation in a case, that, uh, that plea agreement is presented to the court. The court uh, has to approve the plea agreement, but the court's never part of the agreement, so I'm not bound by it. But there are parts of the agreement that, uh, that do bind the defendant in this case and one is that there was an agreement that she would not seek uh, conditional release for a period of time. 
that she agreed that the initial commitment would be institutional care. And I'm satisfied in re reviewing all of the documents at institutional care, looking at reports, what I know about the case, listening to the comments that institutional care is the appropriate type of commitment. So I recognize that, uh, that Ms. Weyer has agreed to that, but I also find by clear and convincing evidence that the, uh, that, that the conditional release of Ms. Weyer would pose a significant risk of bodily harm to herself and others. Thus, the commitment will be to institutional care. As part of that agreement, she, she also agreed to not seek conditional release, which is a way to be released from the commitment institutionally. It's not a release from the commitment itself, but it allows you to go out on, this, on the street, if you will, uh, not to make that request for until uh, July 1, 2020. Under the statute, someone who is committed under 971.17 can, can seek release every six months by, if they have the necessary reports and file that petition. So in their plea agreement to which she would be bound, she doesn't, has agreed not to seek that type of release until July 1, 2020. Now looking at the, at the circumstances of the case, it's uh, in reviewing the matter, as I indicated, I have the courts in any kind of a criminal case, the courts concerned with what the impact is on the victim, the victim's family, and society as a whole. And criminal acts occur against people, sometimes property, but generally people. But there's always an impact in the community as well. It's really a broad impact that that occurs. The letter received from uh, from Ms. Lautner describes very well the 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 uh, impact it's had on on Peyton and on their family. To some respect, in some respects, and that type of impact, the nature of the impact flows out to the community and impacts everyone really with what happened. The dynamics of this case is, is, uh, are simply tragic. Young people involved in what started out as a good time turns into tragedy. Uh, someone is almost killed. Uh, just not a good, not a situation. But that is what happened in this case. In recognizing the impact to to uh, to to Peyton, parts the letter was has been distributed and has actually appeared in the news. Parts of it were reported in in the newspaper, and I believe on the uh, television media as well. But there are aspects that really go to the nature of what happened that I think it's important that the court keeps in mind because the court has to be cognizant of the nature of the crime that occurred in this case. The uh, part of the letter states that, uh, this is Ms. Lautner's letter, states the 19 stab wounds that Peyton endured that day left 19 very visible scars in her arms, her legs, her hip, her torso, and her chest. The nearly six hour surgery and other medical treatments to repair her heart diaphragm, liver, stomach, and pancreas left six more scars. Two of these scars span from just below her neck to just below her belly button. And it goes on to discuss some issues with regard to the scars, but then it talks about something that's almost a very practical result of, of that, those type of injuries, and that is shopping for homecoming dresses leaves only a few options because far too many dresses will show off her scars. Beach vacations are harsh reminders that swimsuits aren't made for young girls with 25 scars. So we have the physical injury, but then you have this other part of it that it's what always reminds Peyton and her family would remind others of what happened. The scarring and how to uh, disclose it or shield yourself from it, shield others from it. A letter goes on to discuss Peyton's wounds being far more than physical, beyond physical and then discusses the emotional trauma, fear she has, difficulty she has as a result of what happened. Letter emphasizes that uh, Peyton, re from one standpoint, from an outside casual observance, appears to have recovered well. She's back in school. She's gone to school activities. She's been actively involved in things. Letter points out that she's more reserved. She's more cautious, all of which isn't surprising when you look at, uh, look at what happened. Talks about impact to Peyton's brother and what happened, uh, his reaction to the 
you know, talks about the impact uh, the uh, the marriage of uh, Peyton's parents. And then as uh, was Attorney McMahon noted as well in the last paragraph, they, uh, Ms. Lawler talks about why they, what brought him to today and what brought her to, to writing the letter. And it talks about, uh, it says, uh, the reasons for the, for agreeing to accepting the plea deals for Morgan and Anissa. First, because we believed it was the best thing to do to ensure Peyton would not have to testify traumatizing or further didn't seem worth it. It's a very practical result, but that's certainly true. Uh, just as you walk down the street and somebody looks at your scars, to come back in and relive everything verbally would be traumatizing and it would be a new injury to her and to the family and also to the community. And second, because Peyton felt placement in a mental health facility was the best disposition for both girls. While Peyton believes a mental health facility is the best place for Morgan and Nessa, she still fears for her safety. She still sleeps with her windows closed, locked, and with security latches engaged. She still refuses to open her curtains. So that's, I think, uh, I think a very, very uh, emphatic statement of the impact uh, to the victim, to the family, and in a sense, and how it reflects back on the rest of the community. That's a factor the court keeps in mind is what was the nature of the offense and, and what happened. In the presentation today is that, uh, is that, is that Ms. Wire, not just today, but, but in all other circumstances. I, I find her to be mature in her presence in court. I think, I, think she, I think she has empathy for what occurred. I do see remorse in what she said. Uh, you look at her coming up, uh, Growing up, uh, undoubtedly a good family, doing well. The brochure that Miss McMahon presented says a lot about a happy little girl of 10 years as she wrote about her life. Undoubtedly, that's the same with, uh, with Peyton and her family, but with Miss Wire, it's certainly reflective. She's had, as uh, Peyton has had, uh, the Lautner family and friends have been here all of the time, and has the, the Wire family been here all of the time and showing support. So you have two young people that get involved in a tough, nasty situation that will impact everyone for a long time. I think what, uh, what Ms. McMahon said about what happens uh, if, uh, when, uh, when Ms. Wire is married, has kids, or kids, how do people around her react to what she was involved in on, in May, on May 31 of 2014. Those are long-standing, deep wounds that uh, I doubt will ever heal. The same is true for the victim as it is for, for the, uh, for the perpetrator, for both of them. When the court looks at uh, a sentence, or a commitment in this case, I look at what I've talked about: the impact on the parties, impact on the, the victim, impact on the defendant. I look at the nature of the offense. It's a critical part. To some extent, I've, I've talked about that. In looking at the predispositional report from Wisconsin Community Services uh, that wrote the report, I said, I think Wisconsin Correctional Services earlier, that used to be their name, it is Wisconsin Community Services Incorporated. The writer presents a really, really good background and detail on, on what happened, the planning for the offense. We have to, in addressing now what the offense was and forgetting about even who the victim is and who the defendant is, who. Who, who the perpetrator was. This was, according to the report and according to the evidence that we have, this was a, an offense that was planned. <laughs> the offense occurred on May 31, but the planning apparently started sometime in December of 2013 or January of 2014. So this wasn't that spur of the moment offense that all of a sudden people get excited and they do something that they regret. This is a planned offense. It was a planned murder. Can't forget that the Effort in this case, the goal of this matter was to kill the victim. It wasn't the wounder, it was the killer. The, and of course, the report talks about the, the, the situation with, the, uh, with Slender Man. It's really been the, much of the sort of the media focus of the case and the media drama of the case is what happened with, uh, with Slender Man and how that had an impact on, on what happened with the offense. 
But the report goes into some detail about the planning and how everything came down the 30th and the 31st. What the report, and we've, that's been in the news and been the subject of much discussion, but it's only something I have to keep in mind and when I decide what the commitment has to be. I look at the nature of the offense, what happened. Uh, the planning part of it is important. Uh, the, uh, the serious part of it, the uh, serious nature of it, uh, a planned murder by kids. You know, it's, I can say a planned murder plan for months and it sounds like I'm talking about some some organized crime operation, but these were kids doing that. The impact is the same, but it's still got to keep in mind the age of the parties, and I certainly do when I reflect on what the best commitment is on Ms. Uh, on Ms. Weyer's young age. In the report, the report goes on to review, begins a review of the uh, Ms. Weyer's current psychiatric uh, emotional status, and does so by first looking at the three reports that were three expert witnesses that testified at the uh, at the jury trial and, and their various opinions. The report goes on to look at Dr. Michael Caldwell, uh, opined that Ms. Weyer was suffering from delusional disorder, persistent depressive disorder. Her delusional disorder was more likely by her underlying sch sch schizotypal disorder. Ms. Weyer exhibited a cohesive system of delusions about the existence of a supernatural evil things that would control the thoughts and actions of others and commonly kill children and their families. That certainly was part of the case and came out repeatedly about the, the delusion, the if impact that the Slender Man character and process had on both uh, Ms. Weyer as well as Ms. Geyser. And he go, then we go on and the writer talks about Dr. Melissa Westendorf, who was another expert that the defense brought in as to, uh, as to her view. She found that there was, uh, that uh, she shared the, the concept of the, of the dual delusional disorder. Ms. Weyer's in that relationship between two people that Ms. Weyer is considered the submissive recipient of the shared psychotic disorder. Dr. Uh, Gregory Van Raybach testified as well as a third expert. Uh, he shared the opinion that uh, Ms. Weyer suffered from a shared delusional disorder. He found and wrote that she became ensnared in a false belief that was constantly reinforced within her relationship with her friend and could not at the time of, of the crime distinguish between those false beliefs, false beliefs and reality. So those are the reports that uh, became more part of the jury trial. They were formed the basis for the jury verdict in this case. But that's the psychological, psychiatric, mental health background that brings us here today. The Significant, what I found, of most much of what I read in the report, I knew, and I knew from prior hearings, but there are parts of the report which were new, and to, to some extent startling about what it has been going on and what the situation has been at the West Bend, at West Bend Detention Center. The, uh, in a section titled Psychiatric History, of course, this report, Ms. Weyer reported that she struggled with depression since around 10 to 11 years old when her parents were going through a divorce. For about the last year and a half, now that's the letter, this report was written in November, so it's going back to uh, 2016. For the last year and a half, she's been meeting with a therapist from Waukesha County Health and Human Services. In therapy, they work on managing anxiety and practice breathing techniques. Ms. Weyer denied ever hearing a slender man talk to her and denied ever feeling like he was in control. She denied any history of auditory hallucinations. Then the report goes on. Reports confirm that Ms. Weyer has been meeting with 
therapist from Waukesha County since May 20, 2016. At intake, Ms. Wire's primary complaints were related to having difficulty coping with her incarceration and guilt about her offense, difficulties in her relationship with her mother. Ms. Weber, Ms. Wire has worked with Ms. Weber on mindfulness techniques and dialectical behavior therapy. In December 2016, Ms. Wire told Ms. Weber about having made a homemade Ouija board in the jail and that some evil spirits were let out. Ms. Wire believed that the evil spirits were pushing down on her bed at night, was worried that the spirits might kill her, and had difficulty sleeping, and had dreams in which God told her that Slender Man and the evil spirits were actually demons. To address this, the therapist planned to work with Ms. Wire on distinguishing the difference between reality and fantasy. However, since about January of 2017, it appears they did not continue to talk about Ms. Wire, Ms. Wire's superstitions and delusional beliefs, but instead focused on difficulties within her family. I'm concerned when I read that, uh, one, that there is an opportunity for therapy and it didn't really take place about the big issue for us and that Slender Man and the, uh, and the, the, and the attempted murder in this case. And that the uh, Ouija board came into play. You know, we, that's a game in some respects, but in other situations it's a very serious situation. That uh, she was allowed to do that at that institution and allowed to have some other issues that will fill up about uh, what one could classify as delusional characters. She acknowledges that uh, she believes that Slender Man is, in a part of the report, she told the uh, the writer, as well as the therapist, that she believes Slender Man is real, sees him as a demon, tries to address him in that fashion. The writer of the report ultimately recommends institutional placement and believes that she, quote, and quote, the conditional release team recommends institutional placement for Ms. Wire and believes that she still poses a risk of harm to herself or others at this time. Under the shared delusional belief with her co-actor, that Slender Man would harm her or her family if she did not carry out his wishes. Ms. Wire took part in the violent stabbing of a childhood friend. Ms. Wire continues to believe that Slender Man is real. She also stated that as recently as July 2017, she believed that an evil spirit was pushing down her, on her bed after the spirit had been let out of a homemade Ouija board and that, she, that she'd been playing with. She has continued to be easily influenced by peers. She has been convinced by another inmate who is a devil worshiper that her co-actor, meaning uh, Ms. Geyser, is possessed. And the report goes on to discuss uh, the uh, comments by Dr. Uh, Raybeck, the, the, the Van Raybeck from his November 2016 report where he states, quote, today Anissa appears to be in full remission from the delusion, but is in need of treatment for about its ramifications. She will need treatment concerning the genesis of the behavior, the behavior itself, and the trauma and distress about attempting to take the life of, the, of another human being. Unfortunately, now this, that's the end of the quote, then the writer goes on to state, unfortunately, none of these issues have been addressed in any therapy of any length. Thus, uh, she, meaning Ms. Wire, still exhibits some of the same characteristics that factored into her offense. The report continues that the team believes that placing Ms. Wire in an institution for an extended period of time would be beneficial to her without the distractions of the community setting and much less risk of harm to herself or others. And discusses a safe setting of a mental health hospital. In looking, I, I went through the report in, in detail because I, it has significant comments that certainly have an impact on what this case is about and what the commitment is about and what direction that 
that, that the commitment should take. It uh, certainly looks at the nature of the offense, at the nature of, uh, of, the, crime, of the crime that occurred. It talks about the uh, safety, safety issues, and get a sense for the, the safety issues that are involved in a case such as this, and what uh, the community has to do, and the legal system in this case has to do to ensure that uh, based upon the nature of the jury verdict, that Ms. Weyer has that opportunity to heal, become a safe member of the community, and function just as she wants to do in the future. There are a lot of roadblocks to Ms. Weyer, of most of which Ms. That, that Attorney McMahon talked about. That It's going to be difficult for Ms. Weyer to, to move ahead uh, just in the long term, even if she gets over the day-to-day -day issues, the long-term memories just like they are for the victim will always be there and have that impact. She has served a lot of time, a lot of time in custody, 1,301 days. That's a long time for many people, and especially somebody so young, it's a good portion of her life. But the court has to be concerned with looking at all of these things, what's the best for the community? Uh, things may be what's best for the community, may not be what's best for Anissa Wire. We have to be careful about that. The, the long-term impact of this case has to lead to a conclusion that it doesn't happen again. We don't have any repeat activities. As much as we can sit back and say, I will never do that again, and I think it's sincere. I'm not criticizing her for saying it. We don't know. And there's enough history here, especially with what's most recently occurred at the uh, detention center as related in the report that delusion still occur and that type of, if you will, evil delusion is still out there, perhaps in another form, leads the court to be concerned about the length, to be concerned about a short commitment period. I think the court has to look at one that's, that's longer and has a more permanent impact in, in protection. There are other factors that the court looks at in determining commitment. Uh, if the if the matter if the Miss Wire is released, where does she live? How will she support herself? Those really don't have a direct impact on what we're talking about today. Uh, have to have assurances that if she's medicated today, she re receives no medication that I know of, other than if she has a cold or some other issue. But from a psychiatric, psychological, mental health standpoint, she doesn't receive any medication. Have to be concerned that if there is medication in the past, that the in the future rather, that it's always available and protections to be sure that it's uh, that it's take that the medicine is taken. What are all of the arrangements for treatment, as well as medications? When I look at all of this and try and put all these circumstances together, and I weigh the youth of youth of Miss Wire the naivety of her when the offense was committed. I look at the nature of the offense. I've talked about that, and I don't want to to overemphasize the nature of the offense, but yet, if you think about it, it's almost like iron filings with, with a magnet. You can't really discuss this case with the disposition of it without looking at what happened. Then you have to look at what impact that has had on people, and what does the future hold? When I look at the uh, and read the report, the predispositional report. I'm very concerned about the near future with uh, comments about the Ouija board and the delusions and the demons uh, that she has. That tells me that Ms. Wire still has issues that we have to be concerned about. The recommendation from the state is that I commit her for 25 years. That's a good portion, good amount of time. I think it's twice how long she's been alive ultimately from that looking at the nature of the offense a long time. The uh, Attorney McMahon argues and argues pers persuasively that the court should look at a shorter period of time and look at to uh, age 25, uh, which would be uh, obviously a sh 12 years less than the state talks about, <clears throat> but still a long period of time for someone to be supervised and watched. One of the concerns this court had at the uh, when the court made the decision about whether the case should be turned to juvenile court or remain in the circuit court was that the juvenile court jurisdiction was short and would end, and we'd have no assurance of community protection after essentially age 18. That uh, when keeping the case in the circuit court, which is where it is today, 
allows allowed the system to go forward as it has uh, with this with this jury verdict and allows for the long term supervision and control. Although the commitment is long that the state proposes and that actually that, that what Ms. McMahon proposes as well, both are long times uh, in the, within a within a system. The, uh, the the person that's committed has the ability to ask for conditional release as the as the her system and as her uh, mental health situation improves. There are many people out on our streets today that are released on that that have conditional releases. They have mental health issues. They've been committed in the, through the criminal process, not through Chapter 51, but through 971, and they're out on the street on a conditional release. They're watched, they're supervised, they go to work, they function, many of them raise families. So the long commitment isn't, isn't sort of being, being confined to the black hole of Kakata for as many years as the commitment is. But it says supervision, it says control, it says monitoring. When I put that together into the mix, I'm satisfied that the maximum commitment is what's necessary in the case for all the reasons that I talked about. I'm not going to go back and re relive those circumstances, but I, I believe to maintain safety, to maintain protection to the community, to maintain protection for Peyton so she has the resources of the community to assist, or rather for, uh, for Ms. Wire, that she has the resources available to protect her in the future, be sure that it keeps her out of trouble if there's going to be trouble, and if it's not going to be trouble, that can be resolved through the system. But it gives the community assurance of safety and protection. It uh, gives Ms. Wire that opportunity to, I think, to proceed and to become a functioning member of the community. The purpose of our legal system, in particular a process such as we're in today, isn't uh, simply to put somebody away and not permit them to grow and to live and to adjust. I'm satisfied that uh, Ms. Wire can do that. She will do it. But she has to do it keeping in mind, as I think she knows, of what happened and the community's perception of what happened. So I'm satisfied the 25-year commitment is appropriate. I'll order that. So ordered. There is 13, there's a request for 1,301 days credit. Any objection to that? I don't want to wake anybody up, but uh, <laughs> no. no. All right. Then I'm going to order 1,301 days credit on credit on the commitment. I raise the issue of medication is one of the issues I have to uh, address is that should be addressed at this fact. It, it must be addressed. The statute says I have to address the issue of medication. At, uh, the state says I should order the medication. Ms. McGann states that uh, indicates that I, I should not. From, a, from Attorney McMahon's perspective, there is no medication in this case. There never has been. Correct, Your Honor. And so no doctor has sat down with her and explained the benefits and detriments of medication and made a determination whether or not, as is required under our laws, whether she has the ability to make that decision herself. And until such time as that happens, I don't think we should order it. If the hospital needs that order, they are not shy about seeking it. Any comments from the state? No, Your Honor. The, uh, the, for those that don't know, the in, in a situation such as this, if a person's prescribed medication and it's for their mental health and they don't take it, the court can order that they be compelled to take the medicine. That's the medication order. The statute says I have to review it at this time. There, as I indicated, there's never been medication administered in this case. There's no outstanding, if you will, controversy about the use of medication. So I'm not going to order a medication at this time, that it be administered against her consent at this time. It'll still may be administered. If there is an issue, the institution will, uh, will, will, will bring it back. With that, then I commit uh, that, that I commit Anissa Wire to the uh, Department of, of Health Services for a period of 25 years, subject to the uh, credit that I've provided subject to the order that I'll issue. I'll order that she be uh, transported to uh, the Winnebago Mental Health Institute today. Your Honor, I don't know that Winnebago Mental Health has an opening today. I tried to reach their um, intake unit to determine that. I spoke with um, Matt Ziegler, who did the report for WCS. 
indicated that generally what he has seen is there's approximately a week wait time. They're in part, I think, because they generally need to make sure that um, blood draws are done, things like that, to make sure that the person is medically stable to come into the, into the hospital. You may know more than I know on that topic. What I do know is that the court did speak with uh, the, uh, one of the officials at okay. Wisconsin Community Services and uh, with the thought that, uh, Ms. If, that the court would at least follow the recommendation through the plea agreement that would be a commitment to Winnebago, that if it, uh, regardless of the length, she'd have to be taken there. And we were told they would expect her today, and I think okay. the sheriff is prepared to uh, transport her there. Okay. Um, now, that doesn't mean I want Ms. Wire traveling about the state, because no. I know that's happened in the past. Uh, we've ordered people to go to Winnebago or other institutions. They get there, and the institution won't take them. So we will fax the, uh, we will fax the orders to Winnebago as soon as the hearing is complete, and we'll verify that it's appropriate. Does the, um, do you want to meet with her family and her today? Um, if we could, Your Honor, I do have to run over to Branch 3 for a matter, um, but then I could join them over at the Juvenile Center. Well, I'm going to order then that uh, as an interim uh, matter that uh, Ms. Wire be transported to the Juvenile Center. She can meet with her family as she has in the past, and that she'll stay there till 4 o'clock. At 4 o'clock, then she'd be uh, transported, and we'll verify what the location is. And if she is, if Winnebago does not have the opening today, um, we had anticipated that she would go back to West Bend, and that's why West Bend didn't send all of her things with her today until she could be taken to Winnebago. Now, that they didn't bring all of her things with her? No. No. All right. Well, then maybe it's bad. Well, we'll verify with Winnebago what the approach is, and we'll take that. Otherwise, the order is that she be transported to the juvenile facility here to meet with her family and attorneys, and then by 4 o'clock leave to either return to West Bend or to go to Winnebago. Thank you. Now, you'll explain to Ms. Wire her appeal rights? Yes, sir. All right. With that, then, anything further from the state? No, sir. Thank you. Anything further uh, from Attorney McMahon? Not at this time, sir. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. Have a good day. Bye. I'll see you.